Since Easter, we have been looking at the seven miracles, the seven signs that take place in the Gospel of John. We looked at Jesus turning water into wine and the healing of the nobleman's son. Last week, we saw the healing of the man at the pool. And today, we're going to look at the feeding of the 5,000. Now, interestingly enough, the feeding of the 5,000 is found in all four Gospels. And each of those accounts contains different details about the story. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not tell us where the fish and the loaves come from. So it's John, and that we're looking at today, where we learn that it comes from a young man. All of the Gospels place the story in the middle of Jesus' ministry. In John, he goes straight from the controversy in Jerusalem over the healing of the lame man on the Sabbath to this story. The other three Gospels say that it happens after Jesus sends out his disciples on a mission trip. He charges them and warns them that their message would be accepted by some and rejected by others. So this is sandwiched in between their going out and, and their return. There's also the account of John the Baptist. John is thrown in prison for his ministry. We also have to examine what happens after the feeding as well. Luke skips directly to Peter's confession of Jesus as the Christ at Caesarea Philippi. John records Jesus' teaching on the bread of life in which many would be offended and desert Jesus. Mark and Matthew record Jesus going into Gentile territory, and the scene goes from Caesarea Philippi to Peter's confession and the feeding of the 4,000 where the Gentiles live. And that's followed explicitly by Jesus talking about his suffering and his death in Jerusalem. And so when we put all these accounts together, we see themes of suffering and rejection by many and acceptance by few. John 6 starts off, after this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Remember, this takes place right after a really big mission project. So Jesus pulls away with his followers to get some rest. Even though the spirit is willing, our flesh can become weak and we grow tired, especially if we're often pushing ourselves. The continual expenditure of energy requires that we have time to rest. So Jesus recognizes this. He pulls his disciples away to rest. Everyone needs to have some downtime from the stresses of ministry. Pastors go on sabbatical. I'm going on my vacation with my family at the end of May. Some of you who have taught Sunday school or worked with the youth group, after a time you have said, I need a break. That's okay. But we feel guilty when that happens. We feel like we're letting our church down, especially if there's nobody uh, there to take our place. But the fact of the matter is we all need to rest. Verse 2 says, And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. So Jesus tries to pull away from the crowds, and they learn of it. They see him leaving. They probably recognize him. And together on foot, they hurry after him. They followed him because, like we mentioned before, they want to see miracles. They want to see the drama that unfolds. And obviously, if you're trying to rest and you turn around and you see a great crowd there, uh, we're reminded that sometimes real life interrupts our best intentions to rest. I would like to think that everyone in the crowd was seeking a savior who would free them from their misery and their sin. But I bet most were looking for freedom from their circumstances. What's the difference? Well, one is a temporary solution and one is an eternal solution. Verse three says, Jesus went up on the mountain and there sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover the, of the feast of the Jews was at hand and lifting up his eyes then and seeing what a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat. You know, initially, 
Jesus pulled away to focus on the needs of himself and the disciples, but it quickly becomes about the needs of others. This is because Jesus operates from a base of compassion. The feeding of the 5,000 occurs because there is not enough to eat. There are not many villages to go and buy food on this side of the lake. The people would have been hungry because they would have walked several miles to get to this place. They had heard Jesus teach, and of course, no one takes time to prepare food uh, as they chase after him. That was, a, that was a spontaneous event. It says, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Verse six says, he said this to test him, for he knew himself what he would do. Philip answered, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? This is a story about resources, isn't it? We talked about rest in ministry, but there's another worry. We want to do this, or we, want, we need to buy this, or we need volunteers, but we don't have the resources. We could have the money in the bank, but if you don't have volunteers, you can't do the ministry. Or it could be the other way around. You know, you, you have volunteers, but no money in the bank. It's hard for us to give our volunteers the tools they need. Your pastor is either always begging for money <laughs> or he's always begging for volunteers. But this miracle story reminds us that Jesus takes what little we have and he multiplies it into what we don't have. Jesus turns our inadequacy into adequacy. Little becomes much when God touches it. You see, all too often we figure because our little won't meet the need, then we reserve it for ourselves. We think, you know, my $5 isn't really going to make a difference, so we don't give it. Or we think, I'm just one volunteer, what difference can I make? But as we see from this young man, God wants us to give to him even what little we have. Our little, fully sacrificed to him, becomes much when God touches it. Verse 10, Jesus says, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. The miracle of the 5,000 occurs in a wilderness place. And remember, there's always more going on just beneath the surface with these stories, especially in the book of John. In the book of Exodus, there's an account of the Jews wandering in a very similar place, a, a wilderness, if you will. And in Numbers chapter 1, all the men who are of fighting age are counted, and each of the tw 12 tribes are listed. And here, we see something similar happening. We have a large crowd, hungry people, and the men are counted. Anyone back then would have had a sense of deja vu. This is what Joshua did before he took the people into battle. Verse 11 says, Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted, and when they had eaten their fill. The Greek phrase here that gives us the idea of the crowd being full is really closer related to stuffed. They were stuffed with bread and fish. It has some similarities again to the children of Israel in the wilderness. They gorged themselves on quail, so much so that they got sick. They ate more than they actually needed. Verse 12 says, and when they had eaten their fill, he told the disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the barley loaves, left over by those who had eaten. And when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. 
Jesus took what they had, blessed the loaves and fish. Did he need to? No. He could have made food out of rocks if he had wanted to. The devil had told him to do that to save himself. But it pleased Jesus to allow us to have a part in his great plan. Even if our contribution is microscopically small in proportion to what he could do. And I'm again going to compare this with ministry. I'm sure there are people in our lives who've rejected the gospel. They've rejected Christ. They are lost. They are walking in darkness. But we cannot save anyone. Our contribution is small. So we do, we, we do what we can. We, we help in our small way. We, we play our part. But it is only God who increases our little contribution and makes it great. What has John showed us so far? Turning water into wine, healing a nobleman's son, healing a man at the pool, and today feeding 5,000 people. Two times Jesus provides food and drink. Two times Jesus heals the body. Jesus seemingly has infinite power and control over the things of this world. We have an impossible situation that occurs. There's no more wine. We don't have enough food. And Jesus conquers the impossible situation. A son is dying. A man can't walk. Jesus restores flesh and bone and brings life back where there was no life. You know, all too often, the world outside tries to paint Jesus as being not enough. He was just a teacher. He wasn't God. He, he, he was only one answer among many. His story is old and irrelevant, or we have no proof that he ever existed. And yet when I read these miraculous signs from John, I am reminded that Jesus is completely able to provide and restore. And not only is it worthwhile to listen to Jesus and to follow him, but as we see here, when we give to Jesus, we end up with so much more than we started with. And notice that the entire crowd sees that too. And, and the last line says, this surely is the prophet who has come into the world. And the Bible says, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. You know, last week, John told you a story where Jesus, without a doubt, claimed to be equal with God. And here, Jesus kind of reenacts an Old Testament story. Joshua counting the soldiers in the wilderness before leading them off to war. Twelve baskets full, certainly a symbol for the twelve tribes of Israel. The people ate food that was provided by heaven. Another reminder, the children of Israel eating the manna and the, the crowd then puts two and two together and they say, wow, just like Joshua, just like Joshua and how he led us to victory. Let's crown Jesus as king. But it was another misunderstanding, wasn't it? Jesus wanted to teach them about eternal salvation, but the people were more interested in their physical needs, in their physical world. Jesus wanted them to be citizens of a heavenly kingdom, but the people were more interested in earthly politics. Right now, they're ready to grab Jesus and march into Jerusalem and overthrow the Roman government and say, you know, from now on, there'll be prosperity with Jesus as our king. And instead, Jesus slips away to rest. You know, a few weeks ago, I asked you a question. I said, do you think Jesus cares about your health? I suppose today we could ask, do you think Jesus cares about your hunger? And I guess a close examination of both questions are really a question of need. 
health, and wellness are needs. I mean, sure, there's a lot of things that we want and a lot of things we wish we had, but certain things are needs. We need to have them. And mostly our wants are things we can buy. They're part of this world that you and I can control. But our needs are much harder to ensure. For instance, can you guarantee that you're never going to get cancer? There's no way. Our bodies are incredibly complex. Most of what's going on inside of you, you don't even know about, much less have any control over. Breathing, heartbeat, digestion, you don't decide what chemicals to dump into your stomach to dissolve breakfast from this morning. You don't have a reminder on your phone that says, okay, time to secrete some bile and generate some enzymes. Like, okay, I'll do that. Ugh. Have you ever heard of CPT code? It stands for Current Procedural Terminology, and they provide information. It's a uniform way of categorizing and coding a medical procedure and a service. Do you know how many CPT codes there are? Over 15,000. And they're adding new ones every day. Measles is code 072. An accident involving a spaceship is code E845. You can diet, you can exercise, but you can't choose the genes that you inherit from your parents. If they passed on a genetic weakness of some kind, you're stuck with it. And then outside of our own body, we're at risk from other people's bodies, right? We can be careful, but other people can cause accidents. Can you absolutely prevent an accident? Even if you're as careful and, as, and a skilled driver, you can't control what the other guy's gonna do. You can work to improve your health, but you cannot guarantee health and safety, not on your own or anyone else's. The need exceeds your ability to supply. There is no area of life in which you can guarantee your needs. Food is not a guarantee. I could go into a grocery store and there's lots of food. There's enough for everyone. True. But you are still dependent upon a farmer and a truck driver and a grocer, and they all depend upon a seed company and an oil company. Not only that, but your ability to pay for the food and clothing and housing and transportation and medical care and everything else, that's dependent on your ability to stay healthy and able to work and the banks not failing. Even within your own family, the people that you live with, you can't control that either. Your relationships with your wife or your husband or your children or your friendships, none of those are under your control. For one thing, they all involve other people and other people's emotions are not under your control. You can't make them do what you feel or want. Verse five says, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? And he asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. What do you think of Jesus' question? There was a need, and Jesus asked Philip, how are we gonna meet this need? It's the first question we ask ourselves when something comes up. What do we always say? What am I gonna do, right? You've prayed that prayer before. I've prayed that prayer before. What do I do? What am I gonna do? But the problem with the question and the issue that Jesus is hoping that Philip will see is that there are limits to what we can imagine. And that is going to limit the response of what we can do. In other words, if you define the need narrowly in terms of what you can do, you will come up short. Here, Jesus' question is a test of Philip's understanding and faith because it assumes that the answer 
to the need it is for the disciples to buy bread for 5,000 people. But that is not going to work. Even if they could have found that much bread, which where they are, out in the middle of nowhere, miles from a bakery, they're not going to. That'd be impossible. The disciples don't even have enough money to purchase the bread. And Philip sees the impossibility of this task right away. This is because when we look only to ourselves and we look to our resources, it only reveals how we fall short. Jesus wanted Philip to think about how is God going to provide? How will God meet this need? And for that, we need to change the question. Not, what am I going to do? But what is God going to do? We need to place our trust in God, that he will provide. Once we frame the terms in, in, in the question, what is God going to do? We need to place our trust in him. Now, does that mean we just sit back and watch? We put our feet up and we just wait for God to act? Of course not. We then offer up ourselves and our resources, however small they are, to God. And we say, these are for your use. We trust in God's ability to multiply and extend those resources to meet the needs. Just like we saw with the water to wine miracle or the lame man who walked. God is Lord of the world and its resources. So naturally, God isn't limited by our lack of resources. In Matthew 17, Jesus says, Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. God can work miracles in small people in small abilities, in small resources, even small faith. Here, note how much the smallness of the boy, right? Because they say it's, it's a boy. The smallness of the lunch is written in comparison to the bigness of the crowd and the need, right? Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon's Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? See the emphasis? First, it's a boy, not a man. He's physically small and he's carrying a small lunch. Five small barley loaves and two small fish. There is to be no question that what is about to happen is going to be the work of God. It has nothing to do with the size of what is offered. It has everything to do with God's power. Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God can supply your needs if you will offer up to him for his use all that you are, all that you can do, all that you have. He can and will supply and bless. Now, could Jesus have manufactured 5,000 loaves of bread out of thin air? Of course he could have. But he chose to work through what was offered in faith to him. He chose to take that meager lunch of one boy and transform it into ample provision for thousands. You know, when an impossible problem arises and you ask that question, what am I going to do? You ask that question because you are looking at your circumstances and you are admitting that you can't see how it's going to work out. Are you going through something like that in your life? There's some wall, some blockage, or some fork in the road and you don't know which way to go. You have no advanced psychological training in conflict resolution. You don't have a family systems degree, no degree in counseling. It's okay. Don't give up. Don't say it's hopeless. Obey God. 
With the little amount of understanding that you do have, act in love to the best of your ability. And watch him magnify that little bit of understanding, that little bit of obedience, and bring healing to your life or to that fractured relationship. You're having a hard time with finances? You're having a hard time making ends meet? You never took a course in money management and you're bad at math. Don't give up. Don't say it's hopeless. Obey God with that little amount of finances you have and trust him to multiply. Andrew offered Jesus a small amount of faith and he multiplied it and enlarged his faith. He can do the same thing with you. Whatever the need, it isn't the size of the need that matters or the small amount of your resources. What matters is the size and the power of your God. Lastly, note that the Bible doesn't say that most of the people got something to eat or that they all had enough. You know, sometimes you just need a snack to hold you over, but what does the Bible say? It says, Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. And when they all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. The Bible says they ate as much as they wanted. There was nothing more they could eat. Jesus didn't just meet the minimum need, he provided above and beyond. And he can do the same in your life if you will place your trust in him. Jesus says famously in John 10, 10, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Second Corinthians 9 says, God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Ephesians 3 says, now to him who was able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Your heavenly father loves to bless you. Not just provide, not just meet a need. He loves to bless you abundantly. Now, does that mean you will always get what you want? Always get what you expect? Does it mean you'll always receive an abundance? Does it mean you will never suffer, never endure hardship, or never experience a financial need? No. It's clear in the New Testament that the Apostle Paul himself went without. But God is always going to give us the best. If we don't get the blessings we desire, you will probably get something even better. If you trust God, we always get the blessings of his infinite love, his wisdom, his understanding. Those are best for us. He is able to provide. He does know what is best and he loves us. And if we trust him, we will get his best. In John 6, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Here is the secret to blessing. True abundance is knowing and following Christ. True abundance is knowing and following Christ. True abundance is having peace and joy and contentment in every circumstance. Whether our circumstance involves prosperity or health, positive relationships, or whether our circumstances involves financial hardships, medical problems, or heartache, the true abundance wasn't the physical bread that Jesus provided. True abundance is Christ himself. If we trust him and follow him, we will always have more than we need. And that's what's truly important. So when we look at how we can apply the feeding of the 5,000 to the church today, God wants us to share what we have. Even though it seems insignificant, 
God can bless it. God can make it great. What is impossible with us is possible with God. We are to feed upon God's word so that we can share it with the world. It is to be shared to all people, small, great, Jew, Gentile. We must also remember to be thankful for what God provides and not to grumble. This is especially true when times are tough and conditions are hard. We must remember that this miracle that takes place in this story was in a harsh place. It was a wilderness environment, and this was not just physical harshness. There was real pain and real rejection, even by the people that were the closest to them. We need to be able to see that the lordship of Jesus exists both in feast and famine. It is he who cares for us. The Holy Spirit reveals to us who Jesus is. He is Lord of all. He is Christ. He is Messiah. And he cannot be made king. He is king. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your blessings each and every day. We thank you for the abundance the blessings, the ways in which we see our needs met. We thank you that you are there, walking ahead of us, preparing a way, and that you are with us in good times and bad, in feast as well as famine. Continue to walk with us each day, nourishing us with the bread of life, ensuring for us a heavenly kingdom your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming out and uh, worshiping with us today. Of course, we want to remind you that we're here physically uh, in a church building on Sunday morning, and we would love to have you with us. Uh, we have services at 930 in the morning, and we have a choir. We're going to sing songs out of the hymnal. We're going to share communion. We're going to do responsive readings. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer. It's going to feel exactly like the church that you grew up with. Or you can choose to come at 11 o'clock. We have a worship team. We're going to have a laid back environment. Come casual, come however you feel uh, most comfortable and bring your kids. We have a full program from birth all the way through high school. We want to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week.